was funny. I've never actually come to an event when, on my way to it, after I finished my show this evening, I was coming here by the subway, and I was, I didn't know. I was like, there could be 300, there could be 30, there could be 3,000, there could be 13. Like, I actually have never had such an effect of not actually having any sense of what it is I'm walking into. And I'm delighted you're here. Thank you. It's an amazing thing to try to hold a space, you know? Because that's the job of the people in the theater. We try to hold spaces, and one of the tricks that they never tell you is that the trick to holding a space is to not to hold it at all. The trick is to give it back to the people who owned it in the first place, which would be your audience. Like, the trick is that they are the font. They're the source that everything comes from. You don't do anything. You just take what they are giving. You mediate it through your experience, and you hand it back to them. That's the actual trick, you know, if there is a trick to performing, that's the heart of it. And it's such a joy to come here tonight, to stand here. Recently, uh, I'm hold, held over the public. I'll tell you the truth. We wanted to go to Broadway. We tried to go to Broadway. We thought we could bring the show to Broadway. I do have a show about brutal Chinese labor conditions. They said it might not be Broadway material. I said, no. <laughs> No, I feel it. I feel it because people love their they love their iPhones. I feel it. We can make it to Broadway. It can be this crazy wedge issue where you know and I and I and the, you know they said they did say you know if if I suck enough cock, if I compromise enough, maybe you can go to Broadway. And I said, well, that sounds pretty good. And then there was you know we were thinking it, the show could be as it is now, mostly me talking about an endless stream of bullshit, much like you are hearing now, you poor motherfuckers. I'm sorry. <laughs> An endless stream of bullshit, but then also there would be dance numbers, and we would get actual disadvantaged Chinese dissidents, and we would bring them on stage, and they would dance and caper for our joy. They thought maybe then it could go to Broadway, because this would be closer to what happens on Broadway, where in these great gilded halls, many of you I know work in the theater, you know that they, these look as Mamma Mia in front of us, these gigantic banners, and inside, People work for slightly above minimum wage to put on the same fucking show eight times a week until they scoop out their own fucking eyes. <laughs> Something they never tell you in Actors' Equity is that they eventually scoop out their fucking eyes, which is why so many of those people have they retire do Greek tragedy because they're fucking ready for it already because their eyes are fucking gone. They don't like to talk about that because it's the unattractive side of the theater. And there are so many unattractive sides. But I'm delighted that this is the way that I got to come to Broadway. I'm delighted to be here with you tonight in this space. And that is you. That is you. Because I wasn't here for six fucking hours. I wasn't here going through whatever the fuck's already happened. I did a 24-hour show in the fall. 24 hour long monologue in Portland, Oregon. I was, I, and I, me, alone, speaking, speaking, speaking. Uh, little breaks, only little ones, then more of that fucking endless speaking and the audience and weaving all the stories together. But the audience is the one that has to live through the 24 hours. You know, I just have to tell the fucking story. They're the ones that bring the energy, that bring the event. We tried to make it an event, we tried to bring people together, but we had nothing like this, this space is a fantastic space. I mean, look at it. Look at it for a second. Look at it in all its grandeur. Look at the setting. Look at the Mamma Mia fucking poster. <laughs> look at the Winter Garden pulsing and glowing like a living thing. Look at the Stardust Diner. So fake. You couldn't even make something that fake. Ah. On the corner, represented. Look at the whole scan of it. Look at Barclay sitting above us, it's a huge blue cube saying, I'm going to fuck you in the ass. <laughs> That's why we have this blue cube. You can imagine the meeting. When they sat together, they said, it's great. We got a zoning variance. They're gonna let us take the top five floors and just turn it into a giant blue cube. Why? Because we shit money. We just have so much money, we didn't know what to do with it. We're keeping it up there. Most of the money is up there. <laughs> If there was going to be a recovery and if we were going to invest in it, we would use the money we have stored in this blue cube. But we won't. We're just going to hold on to it because that's the essential core of corporatism, isn't it? That it's cleaved off from our essential humanity. That's what happened in China. When I talk about China every night, and I've been talking about seven times a week, 
night after night down at the public when I talk about it, what we're talking about is the fact that we carved ourselves off from our manufacturing a generation ago. We made a choice to send our jobs overseas and we sent the jobs and none of our values. And then we replicate that same system because that's the system of corporatization to divorce us from how we actually do things. We've done it with our financial system. We've done it with our real estate. We carve off us from actual thought, from actual human connection. Because when you do not know who is making your devices, when you do not know whose lives you are fucking, when you make the financial decisions you do, when you do not connect those dots together, it's easy to do. I know bankers who are nice people. I know, they're very nice people. I know lots of people who are nice people. Pol Pot was probably a fucking nice person. I couldn't give a shit if you're nice people. I care about our actions. What matters is how will you navigate the complicated ethical landscape of this world? And whose side are you essentially on? Because there is a great desire for compromise in this world, isn't there? We all feel it. We all went to Thanksgiving, probably most of us, and we probably were with people to some degree. Even if they were our friends, they had to compromise. They'd be like, well, here we are, and I'm doing this with my life, and you're a corporate whore! Fuck you! Fuck you! It doesn't go well if you do that. I'm just letting you know that it doesn't go well. Um, we navigate those spaces. I mean, I'm a whore. I mean, one of the things that's essential to understand is to take possession of who we actually are. I'm a whore. I am a proud sex worker. I am a proud worker. I go out there every night and I sell my body to the crowd. And they watch what happens and they listen me say a whole bunch of shit. But essentially, because I am large and funny looking, though I may say smart things, a lot of times they're waiting for me to go, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They will not admit it because they read a lot of Chomsky. But really, they are essentially waiting for me to do funny faces because my face looks like a baby's face. And when I make large, weird noises, they like it. I am a whore. And I whore myself out to corporations because I live in this world. I go and I buy things. They come from corporations. I make decisions every day that are connected to corporations. This does not invalidate our choices to do things with our time and our lives. This does not make us hypocrites on an essential level. It just means that we're realists in a real world. And what it does mean is we wear a great responsibility to try to make every decision we possibly can positively, to try to actually think through the steps that connect one to another. Because it's possible someone out here today, right now, is a temp working in that blue cube. It's possible someone here right now is in the back and they're listening like, wow. This is me. You don't think it's you because you're just a temp. What are you going to do? But you're just part of the system. We each are part of the system. We're each part of an immense system, but the system needs things from us. It feels like corporatism is impossible to destroy. It is impossible to destroy because corporatism is made of people and people cannot be destroyed. But people can be subverted. We know that, right? Because that's been going on for a generation. There's no reason why they can't be subverted in a different direction. People can be pulled off from it. People can learn day by day to try to make themselves a little bit more distanced from where they are. They can try to wean themselves off from the things they're doing. If you know people who are bankers, tell them. Tell them it's wrong. It's a hard thing to do, but it's an important thing to do. We actually need to start drawing lines in the sand. We can't actually just sit around, come to a protest for 24 hours. We are vibrant and live. And then when we tally up who we give our hope and love to, say, this fine, you, what you do at work, you know how it is. It's so complicated. Some things are not complicated. Some things are going to be fucking hard. The reason the Vietnam War divided this country in a terrible way was because the Vietnam War was a divisive fucking issue. And people fell on either side. They split families apart. But it enacted change. Change began to flow out of those wounds because there were wounds. There will be wounds. Blood will be spilled. People's feelings will be fucking hurt. But the alternatives are far worse. If no one's feelings are hurt, then that's corporatism. It has no feelings. It is completely apathetic about your human condition because it is inherently inhuman. It will roll over everything you have and crush it into a mealy paste that will be fed to you in tubes. That is the path of corporatism. And you know this. It's not a metaphor. It's not like watching The Matrix for the umpteenth time and you're stoned and you're like, dude, it's like we're all asleep inside The Matrix. It's not. 
not. It's real. It's here. It happens now. The fact that in my life, people are waking up, are beginning to wake up and look at things. They're beginning to have that metaphor shift. They're seeing a path where things can change. I am so proud of the generation that followed mine. My generation didn't do this. My generation did not truly stand up. My generation spent its time, Generation X, growing up in the shadow of the baby boomers. And I remember feeling that as a teenager and as a young man. The way, the way that it, it just felt like everything you tried to do, it just felt like there was this generation above you who had all the money and the resources just kind of stepping down. It's so impressive that the generation that follows mine could stand up and actually start to talk. It seems like such a, a radical thing, doesn't it, to actually say fucking things. Like, what's radical is to know that what we're doing right now could have happened five years ago, could have happened three years ago, could have happened a decade ago. And many of the issues we're talking about right now still existed just a little time before. It takes that vital spark. You are part of that vital spark. You're fucking here. You fucking showed up. And some of you I know are sitting here and you're cold. And you're sort of like, I am not a vital spark. I don't know why I came. I don't know why I came. It serves a lot of performing. Oh, fucking God. I need to leave, but I don't know how to leave. It's going to be very embarrassing. I'll stay as long as I can. I hope, I hope they hold me here. I hope it's compelling. I just don't fucking know. I feel for you. Because it's not that the story of the theater. That every night we try to hold people's attention. We try to mediate their experiences. And every night, every night, we fail. We fail because even if the show succeeds, even if it succeeds beautifully, the curtain goes down, we let them go. Even at this massive event, 24 hours will end and you will be released out into the world. When I did my 24 hour show, it did come to an end. It was like the whole world waking up when all those people, hundreds of them, and we all stumbled out into the world and suddenly it seemed like everything had changed because it had only been 24 hours, but we had made a choice together to do something extraordinary. And because we made that choice to take one single day and try to make something happen, we experience something I think few people are able to experience, which is the feeling of real brotherhood and sisterhood. These people, you people, no matter what your condition, no matter how much, in real life, I would fucking hate you tonight. You are my brothers and sisters because you fucking came out. You stand here in this weird little fucked up closet. <laughs> That is improbably open to public occupation entirely because of a fucked up technicality that you know a huge number of Bloomberg's lawyers are like, I gotta be, gotta be, this could never happen again. You know, their heads are just splitting open and eagles are flying out. They're like, ah, never again. They're trying so hard to put the genie back in the bottle. They will not succeed. The day after Zuccotti Park was raised, after they marched in there and marched everyone out, after they had a media blackout and, 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 and fucked over a huge number of people, I was on Bloomberg Radio because I had an interview that had been set up way in advance with Bloomberg Radio about my show because sort of improbably someone from the business center at Bloomberg Radio had seen my show and someone improbably wanted to talk to me about it because for some moment perhaps they were like how quaint we will actually think about the workers just for a moment then we will return <laughs> to our usual business so I I already felt weird, because I don't know if I told you, but it's Bloomberg Radio! So, I go up to the Bloomberg fucking ass dump. I don't know if you've seen this. Giant ass dump of chrome and steel and glass. It just looks like a billionaire shit it out there on the street. This ugly modernist fucking thing whose most biggest claim to fame, it looks like it was designed by Mike Bloomberg, because it looks like the byproduct of a little man who wants to feel a little bit bigger. It's just so glassy and so chromey and so perfect. It looks like the dot-com dream of itself just swallowed itself. And you go inside and the escalators that go up have little red pulsing lights. The ones that go down have blue pulsing lights. And they, I get up there. Every other media place in New York I've gone to, be they conservative or liberal, they're all the same. The outsides are very shiny sometimes, sometimes not at all. But when you get inside, it's just people trying in a difficult system to tell a fucking story. They all have bullpen like desks. They look distracted like, that guy over there, he's interviewing you. Ugh. Not at Bloomberg. 
At Bloomberg, you can tell the tent from the financial industry is stuck right in their fucking mouth. There is so much shit. The person who picks me up at the top of the blue pulsing escalator says, would you like something from the lunch bar? They have a lunch bar. It doesn't even have a register. It's just free, presumably. If you live at Bloomberg Financial Services Media Empire LLC, you just wander over and you're like, I think I want some Cheetos. And you just get some. I was hungry, but I did not eat. Because I know that story about the woman and she goes to hell and she's the pomegranate. Next thing I know, I gotta fucking live at this fucking shit pile like seven months of the year. So I eat nothing. And I go up the last set of escalators and they have all these booths and they have names of the world because this is how small men feel important. It's like Tokyo, Los Angeles, and presumably these other nodes of the Bloomberg empire pulsing and sending information. They take me into a room and I sit down and then my interview begins. And it's a by the numbers interview. I've done a lot of interviews for the show. I've talked about Chinese labor a lot. So it's kind of going, I'm on, I'm on kind of automatic. It's, not, it's going fine. I'm looking for angles and things to talk about. I'm looking above the woman's head. There are monitors running, showing, you know, more of the endless Bloomberg coverage of everything. I can't hear the narration, but there's a whole screen playing. And what's on the screen is uh, info facts, you know, that, that the TV loves, so how we love to digest news. Like you guys are an info fact. The info fact about you would be like, there are protesters in a park. There is a number. It is small. Not that many. There might have been more earlier. We don't have that number. Whatever number we got is the number we're putting up. 300. I don't know. They suck. And then they move on to the next one. <laughs> You're familiar with the infographic. So this infographic, I'm not even exaggerating. I just want to be clear that this is actually what it fucking says. It says, number of protesters in Zuccotti Park, 1,000. Number of millionaires in New York City, 61,000. Amount protesters are outnumbered, 122 to one. And I look at this over her head, and this is the moment in the, in the interview when the woman makes an unfortunate decision. And the unfortunate decision is she decides to ask about denialism, because a lot of my show is about denialism, this idea that things happen right in front of us and we just can't talk about it because it's part of our culture. We don't even see it after a while. It's just right in front of us. And she says, you talk a lot about denialism. What did you mean about our denialism about China? And it was like the golden path opened right in front of us. It was like God was speaking to me. I don't know. I was like, I, I did not know that the, 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 the sword was in my hand, but I guess it was. Because the door is open. So I said, well, you know, denialism is a complex thing. It happens in many different contexts. For instance, we're not talking about the fact that we are in the Bloomberg Media Empire headquarters here while Mike Bloomberg has cracked down on protesters just last night and infected. And I'm talking, it's live radio. And the look on her face, I want, I want you to understand this. I think this is important when you're thinking about the context of the world you're in. I really do. The look on her face. She looked fine for a moment, and then she realized what I was saying, and it rippled over her face. It rippled like a special effect done poorly. It rippled, and the ripple was made up of, there was fear, there was anger, but more than anything else, and you understand it, there was disgust. There was this incredible, low-level, hot, white disgust that said, how dare you? How dare you say that man's name here? Out of your mouth, you profane this man's name. How dare you say, the, 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 the feeling like it leached out around, it rippled across her face and then was gone. And then she immediately had to do what they always have to do. If someone calls them their shit, they have to burst into legalese. It was amazing. She got on the mic and said, he is, of course, talking about Mike Bloomberg, Mike Bloomberg of Bloomberg LLC, who is the legal parent of this company. You know, an incredible chain that actually follows the incredible chain of media ownership and corporate takeover that trails behind Mike Bloomberg like a bunch of shitty underwear that he keeps leaving in piles on the street. <laughs> she had to, you know, to say it all out like some kind of, uh, uh, like, like the name of God, like the true name of something that is spilled out of her mouth. And then I began to respond and talk back to her. And then I don't know when we were, I don't know when the program ended. I don't know when we were, we stopped transmitting. 
And then her producer came in and it was heated. And I stood up and I'm talking to them and I'm saying to them, I'm saying to them with a high degree of world weariness mixed with real sadness, actual real sadness, because these are fucking journalists. Fucking journalists. They sit in this fucking room and they report the news. And we had just been talking before the piece, talking about where she lives in Brooklyn and how hard it is. Like, I know it's hard because we live in New York. And New York is nothing if not hard. The whole definition of New York is an improbable place filled with endless bullshit that fucks you in the ass constantly. <laughs> That's sort of the point of living here, is so that we can experience what it is to be on the grindstone of God and constantly be refined by being thrust against it over and over. Usually when we are on the art. <laughs> the G is a unicorn. I do not believe that train exists. No one has ever ridden it. But we hope that one day someone will see one. Probably a virgin, of which there are none in New York, which is why no one is riding it. But I talked to them. I really felt sad. I really. I was like, do you understand? Do you understand that there was a media black? And you understand that reporters would run up and they would show their fucking press passes that they shouldn't even need to fucking have in the first place, but they would show their religion and they would just be picked up and put in jail. Do you understand about the choppers? Do you understand how they locked up the information? Do you understand that? They had no idea. They just sat there and they started interrogating me. They were like, where did you read this? Like, the New York Times blog! The New York Times Open your fucking eyes! Just look! Just look! You're a journalist! I'm a monologuist! I work in the theater. I stand in a room talking to people over and over again seven times a week. That's why I know what people are saying. I don't know what the fuck you do, but you should be able to get out and talk to people, motherfucker. Like, this isn't complicated. It was hard. It was sad. It was, it was horrible. It's, it's always a horrible thing to actually shit in someone's cornflakes. It really is. Like, it sounds so good when you're telling them a story, but you feel like shit when you do it. Because you know it fucked up her whole day. You know that she went home feeling like shit. You know that the producer felt like shit. They all felt uneasy and bad. But you know, that is actually the point. If you do not disrupt people's everyday activity, they will continue to live the same way every day. There are people right now that are unhappy that you are here. There are people that are still unhappy that they're in Tagani Park. Fucking Bloomberg was certainly happy. People tried to drum circle outside his place. People don't like it. That's called conflict. It's not supposed to be all compromise. Some of us have been compromising for a generation. And so the goal, many times the goal, is to actually begin to come to the table, to actually begin to speak. So, I'd like to end my remarks tonight. You've been a wonderful group and very attentive. I'd like to end my remarks tonight with a personal challenge. I would like to formally challenge, and I mean this with every bone in my body. I mean it with all that is holy. I would like to formally challenge Mike Bloomberg to a Mexican wrestling match. Whatever character he desires. He can be the measly weasel. He can be the pious zealot. He can be any of the many fucking people he has pretended to be during his term as mayor. I will wear a nondescript mask of my own making. The rules will be simple. We will simply engage one another in the manner of men, of Mexicans, and of wrestling. We will grapple with one another and use all the tools of the theater. There'll be fake blood. There'll be hawks. There'll be tonsillectomies. There'll be a huge number of weird, fucked up moments. There will be blood and gore. There will be a reckoning. It will be dramatic. You will all watch it. We will all weep to see it. And when I have him down, I swear to you, when I have my knee in his fucking back, when I'm standing on him, the way he has stood on so many. I will give him quarter. I will give him what he gives no one. I will actually relent. I will understand that sometimes when people need to speak, they just need to be heard. I will understand that sometimes when people do things, when they rise up, when they come to places and gather together to talk, it might be because they actually have something to say, something that should be respected, something that should be accepted, even desired. 
Because otherwise you cannot know what the room is saying. If you do not listen to the audience, you are not a performer. You do not deserve to wear the mask. You should leave the ring. Thank you.